wanted something sweet. Even I have to have something sweet from time to time. But anyway, I thought today, because Christmas is coming, the goose is getting fat. And how's the song go? I gotta see some old fat guy in a hat or something like that. I don't remember. But anyway, I, I thought we should talk a little bit about the history of Christmas in a... Uh, Macro view. I don't want to get too too into the weeds here and have a whole semester class because, quite frankly, that would be boring. But the reality is, for the last couple of thousand years, a couple of thousand, two millennia, we've had traditions and practices, and I make some notes so I can you know, try to stay focused. But we've had traditions and practices that are both religious and, and, and secular, and, and they've kind of converged together over the years into, you know, what we what we today call the Christmas season or the holiday season um, as we continue to try to be more inclusive of, of all societies and faiths, etc., etc., etc. But anyway, Christians basically celebrate December the 25th uh, as the anniversary of the birth of, uh, of their big man, Jesus of Nazareth. And some of the customs surrounding that, as you all well know, the exchanging of gifts, very popular. Christmas trees, also quite popular. Mass, way less popular. Uh, food with your family, um, celebrations of that sort, and of course waiting for, um, some may argue, the even bigger man, Santa himself. Uh, but, but these are sort of the customs that we've absorbed. Um, and celebrate today and, and probably will continue on and they'll change as we roll along. Uh, but Christmas wasn't even a federal holiday officially until uh, 1870 in this country. But, but where did it all start? I mean, really, where did it all sort of begin? And again, this is just brief. There are books and books and books on this crap. But the reality is early winter or, or, or late December has been celebrated for centuries before Jesus arrived on the scene with uh, the three wise guys and the, and the kid with the drums, or the drum, I guess he only had one drum. One drum, bum, 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 bum. Uh, But we were celebrating uh, uh, around the solstice on December 25th, uh, like I said, centuries, centuries before uh, uh, Jesus. Um, and they celebrated the solstice, which is December the 21st, because it's the, we always say the shortest day of the year. It, it's not the shortest day. A day is 24 hours. It's the shortest day uh, of light. Um, and I think they, the, the pagans mark that day as the beginning of um, longer days and, and things getting back to, um, to normal. Uh, for example, in Scandinavia, uh, the Norse, they celebrated what they called the Yule. And that began, again, December the 21st, right around the solstice, all the way through January. Now, these cats, they would go and find big, big logs. Um, I guess basically set them on fire and they would celebrate, eat, uh, eat and be merry. And most of the time, these logs, I don't know what wood they use, but listen to this closely. They would last up to 12 days, these celebrations. Sound familiar? The 12 days of... Anyway, the, the Norse uh, uh, pagans that they were believed that the sparks that came off of these Yule logs, um, they'd count the number of sparks and that would help tell them the number of uh, calves and pigs and I, I suppose chicken and, and other livestock that would be born the coming year um, that would hopefully feed them, I suppose. And then Europe in general, um, uh, again, the solstice was a time to be celebrated. Their, their livestock would be slaughtered at that time. Uh, I think two reasons. One, uh, they don't have any food to feed the livestock, so it's a good time to uh, quote unquote thin the herd, uh, if you will. And, um, meat keeps longer in winter because they had snow. They didn't know it, but it was basically a, a refrigeration for meat. So it kept longer. And the wine and beer that they had 
set off, set aside in the spring had started to ferment and now it was time to drink, hence the mead. Um, now in Germany, uh, during this time, they honored a pagan god they called Odin. Now this cat uh, apparently was a more nocturnal guy and he'd fly around at night so the Germans would stay inside uh, because Odin would see people outside and he would judge them, be they good or bad, uh, and would reward or punish as necessary. Sound familiar? Some cat flying around at night. He knows if you're good, he knows if you're bad. And apparently the, Germ apparently the Germans at that time would, hey, if, if I don't go outside, you can't see me. And I think, we'll get to this in a second, uh, I think there's more to Odin in this story. I, I think he kind of splits into two characters that we know today, but I thought it was interesting. Again, he flies around, he looks to see who's good, who's bad. Now in Rome, they celebrated, again, during the solstice and the, the, the end of December, what they called Saturn Elia, Saturn Elia. And it was a huge carnival and festival. Uh, and they shut, sounds familiar, they would shut businesses and schools down. And even the slaves, were allowed to feast and be merry, they felt it was a time of, um, of uh, celebration, sort of recognizing the, the past and looking forward to the future. And uh, they also celebrated um, on the 25th, they honored a god called Mithra, who was the god of the, the, the unconquerable sun. And he was an infant god that they celebrated on the 25th. Sound familiar? Thought it would. Now, for the longest time during this time period, Christianity was much smaller, but those cats, they celebrated Easter. That was their big day. Not the birth of Jesus. Um, it, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even thought about it. It was Easter, it was the Sabbath. This was this is what they, they focused on. And in fact, the Bible doesn't even mention Jesus' birth, and I suppose if you thought about it, um, you know, uh, what was it? Mary and Joseph, shepherds, they, you don't really herd shit in winter. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And even the Puritans, they like to point out actually that the Bible doesn't mention his birth. And the Puritans also don't understand. You, you tend to celebrate a person's death. You celebrate martyrs death, martyrs death, not their birth. And more on the Puritans here in, in, in a second. But so it really wasn't a thing, but at, at some point, uh, Pope Julius I uh, decided to choose December 25th in part because a couple of those days, a couple of those things I talked about, Mithra, and all around their perceived world, the solstice celebration from all the pagans, he decided that, okay, Jesus was going to be born on the 25th and all, all of these pagan festivals were just kind of, kind of put them together and that, that that uh, celebration that Rome had, the Saturn, Saturn Elia, it was known, uh, I don't know how long it lasted, but the Feast of Saturn Elia became now known as the Feast of the Nativity. Now this took uh, 400 years or so before it was adopted in Egypt, and it wouldn't be till the end of the sixth century before most of Europe became uh, used to the thought of the Feast of the Nativity, uh, Saturn Elia, and some of these other programs all sort of to blend into the carnival atmosphere, if you will, of the Feast of the Nat Nativity. And this was a perfect opportunity because what I think uh, Pope Julius is trying to do too is get some of these pagans into his churches to school and teach and you know pontificate what he needed to and if you could get everything homogenized, people now have time to go to the church. Now, flash forward almost a thousand years. Now we're like the 1600s, and there's this cat, Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan, who basically takes over Europe uh, uh, for a brief period, bans Christmas altogether. He has nothing. To, he wants nothing to do with that. The Puritans are out again because, as I mentioned. Puritans, you celebrate the death of a martyr, Jesus, not, not his birth, and point out that there's no clear indication when he was actually born in the big book. So Christmas is canceled. Now the Puritans in America at that time, they're hardcore Cromwell guys. They just follow it hardcore. 
so hardcore, in fact, it wasn't, Christmas wasn't even mentioned at all in the 1600s. It was outlawed in Boston, Massachusetts as a whole, but Boston back then, well, it still is today, but, but it was a really, it was a big place. Boston was the shit. It was outlawed until 1681. If you, if you tried to celebrate what we call Christmas, uh, you'd be in deep shit. Anyway, it wouldn't be for another hundred years before the federal government declared it a holiday. Now, in the 19th century, which would be the late 1800s, the concept of Christmas starts to change from that carnival festival holiday where it's just one big drink fest and party and they're cutting the throats of cows and pigs and, and burning crap and blah, 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 to a more family-centered holiday tradition that we, that we know today of, of, of peace and reflection, uh, and that's caused really, and it's fascinating, I, and I, I should probably do some more videos on this in depth, but we won't because I'm prattling on too long because I just basically drank a bottle of booze or whatever this is, mead. Anyway, Washington Irving was an author, crack a book. Um, one of his more popular, famous books, it, it's, it's called The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Cran, a Gentleman. And it's stories of Christmas. And, and his stories of Christmas... Uh, again, start to shape less of the carnival. We're going to go party, party it up and get plowed and, you know, wake up with gravel in our hair in some strange bed to a time of, well, let's look on the family, spend time reflecting on oneself and others and, and how you live your life. Also, about the same time, this cat named Charles Dickens writes a book called The Christmas Carol, which promotes goodwill towards men. Tolerance of mankind. You've all, I, I don't know how many of you have read the book, but you've all seen one variant of the movie, whether it be The Muppets Christmas Carol, George C. Scott's Christmas Carol, uh, Jim Carrey's Christmas Carol, Bill Murray's uh, Christmas Carol, Scrooge, which is a good one. There, there's so many, Reginald Owen's Christmas Carol from the 30s, which my family watched every year, and it sort of solidified. Uh, well, at least in our household, it's the best Christmas Carol movie ever. I am a fan of Scrooge, but Reginald Owens is the best. It's the most fun. But the concept of promoting goodwill, reflecting on the past, the present, and the future, and keeping Christmas in your heart, and these concepts of nostalgia and all of this stuff, was born out of Washington, Irving's books, and most importantly, Charles Dickens, not, not his greatest book, I suppose, but probably the greatest influence on mankind as we know it. Help shape the Christmas that we know today. Now I know what you're asking, what about this cat Santa Claus, this fat bastard wearing a red suit flying around? I'm gonna get to that right now. So this cat named uh, St. Nicholas, uh, born in Turkey in 280 AD. He's a, uh, he gives up his fortunes and he works with children and sailors and lepers and by all accounts sounds like he's a really, really a good cat. Well, um, he, he does all these things and no one really knows about him, um, at least in this country. It, it first entered our culture in the late 1700s um, because a, a lot of Dutch families had immigrated, immigrated into the country. And they used to honor the death of this Saint Nicholas, who they called Sint Nicholas, which I think is Dutch for Saint Nick. And the nickname or a short way of saying Sint Nicholas was Sinterklaas. Sinterklaas, which slowly became, you know, the Santa Claus. This guy took his fortunes and tried to help people and sort of became Santa Claus. Now, this is where I want to go back to the, uh, German god, uh, 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 Ogden, I forgot his name already. I think Santa Claus and Krampus are sort of a split of that cat. Cause you remember I said he flies around at night nocturnally and he's looking for uh, the good and the bad and the good, good guys get shit and the bad guys take a beating. Well, that's Santa Claus and Krampus. It's just sort of split in two. That, that's just my opinion. Not that I don't think that's a, historical observation. But anyway, Sinterklaas becomes Santa Claus. 
Now you flash forward a little bit and this, uh, this cat named uh, Clement Clark Moore wrote a poem called An Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas. Now I know what you're thinking, Ryan, I've never heard of it. Yes, you have, you, you, you ignorant wretch. It's better known today as Twas the Night Before Christmas because it's the first line of the poem. But the, the poem is actually called An Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas. And that's the first time the reindeer are mentioned and we all know the poem, you know, uh, do I? Was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Stockings were hung by the chimney with care. We hoped that St. Nicholas would soon be there. Uh, Ma and her kettle and I and my cap. What's a kettle? Hong, a long winter's nap and a long winter's clock. Anyway, anyway, that set into motion the reindeer and helped further solidify the Santa Claus or Santa Claus that we know today. And then in about 1881, there was a political cartoon. Yes, there was a political cartoon by this cat named Thomas Nass, who solidified the image of Santa Claus, sort of as we know it today, with the red suit and the white beard and the jolly nonsense. And then it was really cemented by Coca-Cola in the 50s, their ad campaign with the rosy cheeks, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, so there's sort of a very, very, very brief history of where Christmas comes from. And I think it's an important thing uh, because it, it really is a wonderful time of year of, of, of reflection. The, the new year is always my favorite holiday just because, you know, take a day, count your blessings, which most of us have, uh, I mean, immeasurable blessings. And, and, any, anyway, and look forward to, to the new prosperous year. We all do the same thing. I need to lose weight, drink less, try to be better and everything. But here's a few Christmas facts, I, not to bore you any longer than I already have. But each year, 25 to 30 million real Christmas trees are sold in this country. 30 million Christmas trees. That's amazing. And there's only about 15,000 crispy tree farms across the country. So, and to give you an idea, it takes about 15 years for that tree to get to be the length of a tree that a cat like me can afford, mine's fake, for an average household. For those of you with vaulted ceilings that have, you know, trees that are 20 feet tall or 30, I, I can't imagine. Um... What else? The first eggnog made in the United States uh, was consumed by Captain John Smith in, in 1607 at the, the Jamestown settlement. And we all know Captain Smith and the Pocahontas story, but that's a tale for another day. The Salvation Army has been sending those Santa, those Santa Claus cats out with the, with the bells. Oh, I need to talk about the bells in just a second. Um, since the 1890s, poinsettia plants, poinsettia plants, they're actually named after this cat named Joel R. Poinsett, who is an American uh, minister who went to Mexico, and he brought back that flowery plant uh, in, in 1828. And I don't know exactly why it's tied to Christmas, but I just thought that was an interesting fact. And remember the Rudolph, the most famous reindeer of all, that was a product of this guy named Bob May's imagination in 1939. Uh, he wrote a poem about the, uh, the, the, this reindeer to help lure guys or families into Montgomery Ward's, the department store. For the younger viewers, Montgomery Ward or Monkey Ward's was comparable to Sears, which you might not know what Sears are. So it was sort of like a, shit, an upscale target, I guess. That's not even a treasury, uh, uh, a best. No, that's not it. Jemco, Fedco, my older viewers know what I'm talking about, right? But Mon Monkey Ward, the, the toolbox that my father, when I, he gave me, it was his, is a Montgomery Ward toolbox. I've got a, se uh, not Sears, what's it called? What are the tools? Craftsman, I have a Craftsman toolbox. But the one that I hold near and dear to my heart was the one that my, my father had that he uh, gave to me years and years and years ago. But anyway, um, one other thing. What's with all the bells at Christmas? Think of the songs. I got a couple here. I, I, I gotta do a look into this, but what's with the bells? You, you, you got songs, silver bells, jingle bells, jingle bell rock, carol the bells. I heard the bells on Christmas day. 
sleigh ride. Just hear those sleigh bells jingling, ling a ling Right, a lot of bells. Ding dong, merrily on high. The heaven bells are ringing. What, carolin, carolin, the Christmas bells are ringing. Here comes Santa Claus, the bells are ringing. White Christmas, to hear the sleigh. What, what's with all the bells of Christmas? I really don't know. Anyway, I'm sorry I digress. I've been drinking most of the day, so I'm, um, I don't say that I'm drunk, but I shouldn't be driving. But I wanted to just share just a, isn't it amazing what we celebrate today, how it's a, a modulation, is that a word? How, how tr pagan traditions and religious traditions, things sort of come together and religions grabs this and we grab that and we're going to just sort of say, and, and we'll just take a moment and reflect on that because we're so polarized. And the reality is we don't need to be. You, 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 there's, there's so many things in the past that we just sort of take from each other. Hey, this works, this works. And if it brings people together, how is that bad? And Christmas and the new year, uh, which is a lot of people's favorite time of the year beyond the material aspect of things, which, which gives parents an excuse to spoil their children, especially those that don't maybe aren't as wealthy as they would like to be to spend a little bit more on their kids, which is an amazing thing, without the feeling like they're spoiling, spoiling them. I'm not a religious guy, as most of you know, but I also find it fantastical that you spend a year, I'm a big person that believes in reflecting and, and looking at your triumphs and failures and then saying, okay, well, what are we gonna do next year and try to be a better person? And you all know my catchphrase and I, I believe it's, it's super true, and I'm going to give you a new one because I get a kick out of this. But you want the new one first, or should I give them Well, okay. One, thank you so much for watching. At the at the recording of this, I have 190 subscribers, which is amazing. Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. I love doing these things. I know some of them are terrible, and some of them are okay, and some of them are kind of good. But in this world, when you could be anything you want during this season, you be kind. Be humble, be forgiving. And my new sort of line is, uh, in the game of chess, when the game ends, the king and the pawn go back in the same box. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, we'll talk to you soon, bye.